Take your Bible, stand with me if you would. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I've got a, a, a lot to cover in a short period of time. So uh, join me if you would in verse number 17. John chapter 21, verse number 17. The Lord, uh, he's already been crucified. He is uh, risen from the grave. He ha has been uh, uh, spotted with, uh, with the faithful. Uh, he is now with his disciples. They're having a, a meal. You can tell they're Baptists because they're eating here. And uh, in verse number 17, Jesus is in the middle of a conversation with Peter. And he is really getting personal. I mean, it's getting really personal here. And he says in verse number 17, He saith unto him, The third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest that I, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Lord, bless this message tonight. Help me as I preach it. May you perform in our hearts, in our lives, what you desire to be performed in it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. My question to you this evening is, why do you do what you do? As a Christian, why do you do it? What is your motive in doing it? I've been in the ministry now for about 30 years, and I have found, actually longer than 30 years as I think about it, there, but I have discovered that uh, people do what they do for God for various reasons. When I was younger, I did what I did because I had to. I was a preacher's kid. And even though I was a preacher's kid, I'll confess I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church. And I did what I did because of my drug problem. I remember one time I told my mom, Dad was out preaching somewhere there, and the Bible said that the woman's the weaker vessel, so I thought I'd try it out with that. And, uh, and I told her one day that I'm not going to church. I found out that that weaker vessel was not my mother. <laughs> my, my mother, I, I, I believe if you find her, uh, uh, she, can, uh, she would be in the encyclopedia for the person who can <laughs> hit you the fastest than any person alive on the face of this earth. And my mother never believed on, uh, on disciplining you later. She would discipline you where you committed the sin. And she carried with her the weapon of her choice, her hairbrush. And it was deadly. What do you mean you're not going out of there? Now my dad, on the other side, he was calm, cool, and collected. When he disciplined, he said, go to your room and think about what's coming. <laughs> that was almost worse than what was coming. <laughs> After about six hours of sweating it in the room, <laughs> and finally you hear him coming up the stairs. Oh, the door would open, and I'm screaming, ah! <laughs> Assume the position. <laughs> Out came the belt. That belt is now bronzed. <laughs> Over the fireplace, inscribed are the words, I need thee every hour. <clears throat> I did what I did because I had to. You know, we kids, we usually find ourselves in that position, right? We do it because we got to. But you could be a Sunday school teacher. You got your position. You could be a choir member. You could be a bus driver. You could even be the pastor. You find yourself doing the motions because it's your job. It's your duty. Why do you do what you do? 
You know, I find some people do what they do because they are, they've learned, I'll scratch your back, God, <laughs> if you'll scratch mine. I'll do for you because then I'll get. There's going to be something in it for me. When I was 11 years of age, my dad had, I grew up in England as a missionary kid, and one of the churches that my dad had started was on an American air base. It was Upper Hayford around uh, Oxford. In fact, actually, when our planes went to bomb Libya, this is where they took off from. And um, now that was the long time ago, Libya, or not the more recent one, anyhow. But uh, uh, so I was around 10, 11 years of age there. And, uh, and I remember uh, they, were, they were having a watch night service. How many of you know what a watch night service is? That's almost uh, uh, unknown to many people today. And uh, usually that was the time we would give young preachers their first time to preach. And we'd have about five or six lined up. And, uh, and they'd preach for about 10, 15 minutes. And it, it was a good time there. And you could tell uh, it was a Baptist meeting because you know, they were going to take up an offering, you know. And uh, food and offering, get giveaway there for Baptists. But, and I was sitting in the back like good Baptists do. And, 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 the, and the building was only about the size of you know, this, this one section of pews there. And I was sitting in the back. And they started taking up an offering. And, uh, and, and it was unfair, absolutely unfair. See, God has this thing called omniscience. He knew that I had all my Christmas money in my pocket. And God started speaking to me about giving it in the offering. Not some of it, all of it. All two pounds. They were paper back then. Some of you don't even look. I know some of you have been to England. You don't know what paper pound notes were. Now I was sitting in the back there with my Christmas money, and I had big plans for that, you know, candy. And God said, give it. Well, the offering plate came to me, and I didn't want to. I was trying to argue with God. Well, what if I keep one and give one? You know, and all that stuff. And the problem was is that I was telling God, I paid you on Sunday. I'd already given my tithe. I'd already given my faith promise. I'd already given to you, Lord. This is mine. <laughs> A little 10-year-old, 11-year-old, we don't have much, Lord. Well, to make a long story short, the offering plate came, and I held it for a moment, and really, um, <laughs> and I reached in my pocket, and I grabbed it, and I put it in, and I passed it on. Just, fe just felt thankful that I obeyed God. I didn't think much about it. Dad and I, we were going to drive home. It was about an hour and a half drive back home, but uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve, you know, some people are full of the Spirit then. I, the roads had gotten a little icy. So uh, Henry Glickler, uh, a converted Jew, a man that my dad had led to the Lord uh, in the uh, Air Force, and, and uh, he invited us to stay the night and leave later in the day, and the roads got better. So we got over to his house, and his wife had bought him for Christmas. I, and I just found it. I just found this game. I was just packing up my homes, my, my, my parents' home. They, uh, they are retiring from the ministry, 47 years on the mission field. And I, as we were packing up, I found this game. Remember those Mattel computer games? Those little red dots? Some of you as old as me, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, you know? You, you, some of you kids, you don't know what living is like yet. You know? You, know you, you, don't, you don't have to use imagination. We've got imagination. And these little dots were players in the, in the basketball game and stuff. Where beep, 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 beep. And I was playing with his game. That was his Christmas present from his wife. Man, and I was having a time with that thing. And, and 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd arrive there, and they were getting tired, ready to go to bed there. And they get to, Daddy took the game from me, and he said, Tommy, go to sleep. And I went to sleep on the couch. Now, I don't know what time it was, but I woke everybody up to beep, 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 beep. I mean, I knew sooner or later we were going to be leaving, so I was going to get every bit out of that. Beep, 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 beep. All three preppies. Beep, 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 beep. Well, it's time to go home. Daddy said, put it down, so I put it down. We got out in the car. And as we were backing up, Henry came running out. He knocked on the window. I rolled the window down. He said, Tommy, I want you to have my game. This was expensive. 
And I knew exactly what was just happening. You see, I had heard it before. Dad had preached, you give your little bit, your little teaspoon, and God will open up the windows of heaven and he'll get his shovel. And he'll pour out a blessing on you wherewith you'll not be able to receive it. And I had seen and witnessed for the first time in my life where I gave to God what I thought was all, what I thought was a big sacrifice, but in reality it was small. But what God gave me in return was, woo, something else. Now, if you, now this was a problem because, you know, I mean, I was turning Pentecostal at that moment, and I got my Baptist preacher next to me. You know, and so how do you do that? I said, praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah. And inside I'm going, yeah! And all the way home, I was like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> you can't outgive God. You can't. God's good. He'll not be a debtor to any man. Now, I tell you that story because of what happened next. And what happened next, though, wasn't so good, though. I got to thinking, man, I can cash in on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, two pounds gain. I couldn't wait for the offering on Sunday. Man, my, my folks would give me my allowance, my pocket money on, on, on a Saturday, and they taught me to you know, put aside my tithe, put aside my faith promise, and, and put aside what was for me there. And, uh, and, and I thought, man, <laughs> on Sunday I had it all in my pocket. I didn't divide it all, man. I just had the faith promise, and all of it was going to go in. And the offering plate came, and poof, I put it in there, and I went home, and I was excited because I was going to get a brand new bike. <laughs> 10 speed, red, everything, man. I was so excited. And Monday came by, no bike. Tuesday came by, no bike. Wednesday, no bike. Went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, no bike. That's right. And I thought, we're talking a bike here. So it's going to take two weeks of this. So I threw it in again the second week, and the third week, and the fourth week. And I'm here to tell you, folks, I'm still waiting on that bike. <laughs> I never did get that stinking bike. <laughs> now, you know why, though, right? right? See, the first time I gave, God blessed a little boy because he gave out of obedience. He didn't want to at first, but he still gave it. And God blessed him. But the next time I gave, I gave it all for a whole month. But it didn't impress God one little bit. It stunk in the nostrils of God because I was giving to get. Why do you do what you do? You know, I, I want to get to the chase. Turn back to our passage. Why should we do what we do? We can all have wrong motives. But what should be the right motive? What should be the thing that we do for God that really will honor Him? Now, will He be pleased if we do it out of obedience? Absolutely. But you know what? There's something better. There's something better. You know why we should serve God? You know why we should do what we do on Sundays and why we do what we do for the Lord through the week and do with our lives for the Lord? We should do it because we love Him. You know, when I was younger, I had to take out the trash. That was one of my jobs. Well, we didn't call it trash. It was the rubbish. We'd throw the rubbish in the bin. And I hated that job. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a hard job. But I did not have a good attitude at all. You know, go, 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 go. I was obedient, but I had a bad attitude. One time, I don't know what overcame me. I don't know. I just, just possessed or something. And one day I saw that this trash can, this bin was full, and so I just grabbed it and went over to the other room, grabbed that, and in the other room, grabbed that stuff there, and went outside and threw away the, the rubbish there and came back in. My folks had passed out. <laughs> I 
guess a little bit of love got in the way. <clears throat> we ought to do what we do because we love God. But do you love him enough? Look at this passage. John chapter 21. Jesus has already asked Peter this same question. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, Lord, I love you. And, and as if the Lord didn't hear him, he comes again in verse number 16 and asks him the exact same question. Now, P Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Now, I, I thought maybe, you know, there was a communication problem here. But actually, and, and our Bible is, in, is translated correctly, but we miss something in the translation from the Greek to the English because there's some intensity in the word love that's being used. There's three words in the, in the Greek for love. When we translate it into English, it just comes out love because we don't have the, you know, the words to really define that like the Greek do, like, like in the Greek language. So there's eros, that's a, uh, uh, the, you know, a love between a husband and wife, that's a, you know, an intimate type of love. Then there's a phileo love, a philos love. It's a buddy type of love. It's a fondness, a liking. You know, when you're out there and you say, you know, I love pizza. You know, that's kind of what you're saying. You know, I phileo pizza. I, I'm really fond of that, okay? Or I'm really fond of my buddy. Now, if you say, in other words, yeah, agape, Agape love. Now you say I agape pizza, you got a bit of a problem here, especially if you say Eros pizza too. Anyhow, yeah, that's another story. We'll need counseling for that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Brother, I'm gonna blame you. You're making me be you missed me. Hey. It's your fault. That's your fault tonight here. <clears throat> Now look at it. I'm blushing. I can't believe it. <laughs> we better move on. <laughs> Shall we pray? <laughs> All right. So agape love is the unconditional, ultimate type of love. It's a love willing to lay down your own life for someone else that you love. Willing to give up yourself, the greatest love. Now when Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? He's actually saying to Peter, do you have that kind of love for me? Do you agape me? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I like you. I'm fond of you. See, we miss that when we read the English. And he says to him a second time, Peter, no, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. I'm fond of you. I like you. Now we get to verse 17 because it changes. Now the Lord changes his word for love. And he says, Peter, you phileo me? You understand why he asked the question again? And now in verse number 17, he says, Peter, you philos me? Your love here is just a fondness for me? Now can you understand why Peter is grieved? Look what he says. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Phileo thou me. Now, when I first understood this, when, you know what, this is why I paid all that money to go to Bible college to learn yeah. stuff like this. Yeah. All right? So that we can kind of look smart in front of you guys, okay? <laughs> no. It helps. It helps. But when I understood that, when I was in Bible college, what Peter was saying, what the Lord was saying, I never understood, why is he asking three times? Well, when I studied the Greek, it was like, oh, wow, that's a different story. This is a new dynamic in here. And when I understood what the Lord was saying, what Peter was saying back to him, my first response was, I was mad at Peter. Man, I wanted to punch him. Man, if I could go to heaven, I'd go, come here. <laughs> Take that, you dirty rat. This is the Lord of heaven. You were with him for three years. You saw his miracles. You walked on the water. You saw him transfigured. He's now risen before you. You saw him die, and now he's alive. And all you can say is, I'm fond of you. That bothered me. 
I was just newly married, and my wife was like, Tom, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. I'm just studying this thing in the Bible, and, and I, just, I just don't understand. It's bothering me. It went on for a whole week. I was mad at Peter. Well, I thought I was mad at her. <laughs> yeah, what, what's, right, what's wrong? No, no, it's just, just, I just, uh, just heavy in spirit on this, and I just... I, I'm just, I don't, I don't understand something here, and it's just bothering me. It's, 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 it's okay. God will deal with it, you know. You don't come to me. And after a week, finally, I saw something there, and it was like, I get it. Here, look, look, look what happened. In verse 17, let's read it. It says, And he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, uh, Phileo thou me. Peter was grieved in his heart because he said unto him the third time, Phileo thou me. And he said unto him, here it is. Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I phileo thee. You see, folks, here's what Peter understood. Peter was realizing, he was saying, God's not, Jesus isn't asking me this because he doesn't know the answer. Have you realized that? Jesus, God never asked a question for his information. When he said to Adam and Eve in the garden, where art thou? It wasn't because he wasn't good at playing hide and seek. He knew where they were. They needed to know where they were. They were hiding from God. Why would you hide from God? Because they were naked and ashamed. So when Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? He's realizing, Lord, you know. You know me. You know that my love for you is only phileo. I'm ashamed to say it. It hurts me to admit it but I only love you with a fondness, and that's it. You know why this was so difficult for Peter? Because I believe Peter illustrates for us like he, we relate more to Peter than we care to admit. Can can, can we just be honest here? I think Peter really uh, personifies a lot of us. Peter was under the impression that he agape God. That's what he really wanted to think about himself. In fact, he strutted himself around like he did. He said stuff that gives us evidence that he was like that. Let me give you some examples. Remember when they were in the upper room and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Who was it that went to Peter? Who was it that went to Jesus? Now, now Lord, you know, I don't know about them. Well, maybe I do, but (laughs) I'll be with you. I'll be with you to the end. A guy who talks like that is talking agape talk. But did he have the agape walk? (laughs) The Lord said to him, Peter, before the night's out, you're going to deny me three times. God put it to the test. It revealed what he really was like. He was a phony. And now the Lord says, Peter, you agape me? He's not putting on any more pretense. The show's over. He is open wide before the Lord. And he said, Lord, you know. You know all things. You know that I just have been living my life and my service for you with phileo love. And it grieved him. It broke his heart. But after this interview, from this point forward, You see Peter being used of God like God has used very few men. Because after this point, you see Peter being a man 
who really stepped into agape service. No longer was it phileo. He has been humbled. He has been broken. He has been exposed. And he knows his Savior knows it too. And he says, enough! Enough of that! For now on, it's everything. He stepped from the phileo into the agape. Hey, it kind of brings me back to my earlier sermon. He said, I'm no longer going to live in commitment where I'm in control. That's phileo love. And now he said, Lord, I'm surrendered. It's agape now. And God used him like he used very few men. How many of us are living under the illusion? How many of us are living the phony commitment life? And saying, God, you know, we can get mad at Peter, but how, much, how would that work if, it, if that question was really at you? If the light was on you and the holy God of heaven who knows you, what would you honestly have to say? With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand to our feet.